The Lord be with you. Good morning. We can keep this up all day. Uh, it's good to see you all, and we welcome you to worship and welcome our visitors, and we're glad that all of you are here. Let me remind you that the Parade of Cans is coming up in August. Now, last August, we, you know, we were outside and we did a medium job, maybe less than a medium job, of filling up the baskets with cans. And last March, you know, two Marches, it was dismal, you know, the, the March Madness thing. So the corner table needs our donation. They need a lot of donations, but they specifically need them from us. So, Parade of Cans every Sunday in August. Let's turn our attention to the call to worship. You are no longer strangers and aliens, but members of the household of God. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple. Let us worship God and let us pray together. O God of promise, who in Christ assembled the alienated and the excluded into the folds of your compassion, we give you praise for your redeeming grace. You break down dividing walls of hostility and fill us with your spirit of reconciling love. You set our feet firmly on the foundation of your goodness and impart to us wisdom that enlightens our days. You are God who indeed promises new life to all. Let us continue our prayers and confess our sins. O oh God, sustained by your mercy, we make bold to confess our sin. We expel strangers and deny hospitality. We judge others all too freely. Our hasty words cause conflict and tension. We are disturbers of your peace. As you sent Christ to reconcile your people, Forgive the failings of our unredeemed humanity and show us once again the image of your Son who loved his enemies and taught us to do the same. And God in his love conquers sin and death on the cross. In Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Amen.
right, good morning. So our lesson today comes from Ephesians chapter two, and it talks about two groups of people who live their lives very differently. So you have the Jews and the Gentiles. Now, each group had a very different set of rules on how they lived their life and what they believed in and things like that. But what brought these two groups together is that God sent Jesus. And as Jesus was teaching and preaching, the people from these, both of these different groups began to believe in him and who he was and what he came to earth to do. And Jesus was that bridge between those two groups. So the thing they had in common amongst their differences was Jesus and their love of Jesus. So as you look around the congregation, you see people who are different than you. But the one thing we have in common is that we love Jesus, right? And everyone is different and they bring different skills and gifts and different things and those differences come together and they make the church. And that's so cool because if we were all the same, it'd be really boring, right? So as you go throughout your week this week, I want you to begin to, when you meet somebody new, if they're different than you, try to see the beauty in those differences. The beauty in those differences. Sometimes nowadays we may look at somebody that's different, that looks different than us or speaks different than we do or anything, anything different, and we think it's bad. But really it's not because even if somebody believes different than you, the common thing we all have in common is that we're God's children and we should love each other like we are God's children, right? So as you go throughout the week, start noticing those beautiful differences between you and other people. And if it's hard to do that, ask Jesus to help you see the beauty that he sees in each person. All right. So after we say our prayer, you can um, go with Miss Leanna and Mr. Parker's going to be doing the lesson today. And you can go down for a blast. All right. So let us pray. Repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for our differences. And thank you for your son, Jesus, who helps us see the beauty in those differences. Amen. We are reading from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. So then remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone, 
In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. The word of the Lord. So I don't know how many of you know much about Judd Strunk. Doesn't look like anybody's ever heard of Judge Strunk. He was a folk singer who lived on a farm outside of Farmington, Maine, and he died fairly young in an airplane crash many years ago. Well, the church that I served in Pennsylvania had a habit of going to Farmington, Maine every summer to do mission work for a thing called Mission at the Eastward. And one night, some of us were relaxing outside of a restaurant on the deck when a guy came outside of the restaurant to have a smoke. And he greeted us, because that's who he was. We talked a little bit. He was running some kind of a showcase for local bands inside, and they were fairly awful, but... <laughs> Knowing he was a musician, I said, well, have you ever heard of Judge Strunk? He said, well, everybody, any, any musician who lives around here knows about Judge Strunk. He's our hero. Come on, let's go inside. So we got up and all went inside. And he threw the band off the stage. It was no great loss. <laughs> and he got up there and introduced all of us as a group from Pennsylvania who were here to do mission work and who loved Judge Strunk. And, and the other people were all looking at me like, we love who? You know? And then he said, so let's all sing. And he started playing Daisy a Day, which is Judge Strunk's closest he ever had to a real hit. And you should, you should Google that this afternoon and listen to it, because it's a wonderful song. Anyway, Judge Strunk had another song, much less well-known, called Jacob Brown. And the chorus of that song says, I recall a boxcar and a bedroll, supper cooking by a railroad track. That was home to us, and it made no difference that I was white and Jacob Brown was black. Now, if you don't know that song, you should look it up. It, it only takes three minutes to hear the whole thing because he didn't write long songs, so it won't waste too much of your time. But anyway, forget about Judge Strunk for a minute, but keep that in your back of your mind. And let's look at Ephesians. And let's imagine that this passage is speaking to us. What could it mean to say we're no longer strangers and aliens? I mean, we've never felt like strangers and aliens, right? Maybe that first day when you went to college or first day you showed up at work, you felt a little weird because you didn't know things and people. But we've always known our way around this society. But imagine that you never felt like you were part of it. You never felt welcome. You never felt like you fit in. And that's how many people in our world today feel, especially people of different races. And, I, you know, I'm not trying to blame anybody. I just want to point something out that that is how people feel in the world in which we live. So if you're feeling that way, what would Ephesians be saying? I mean, it might be a call to freedom. It might be saying there's a new world coming. Things are going to be different. And I hope it sounds that way to all of us. Because a new world is coming. God is going to change this old world and bring a new reality into existence. Now, years ago, I had this class, and one day we had a guest lecture, Dr. James Samuel from Hood Seminary in Charlotte. And he said to us, you know, you white folks go to church on Sunday to hear the message that the status quo is acceptable and will remain. 
But then he said, but black folks go to church to hear that God is not happy with the status quo and the status quo is going to change. So very different things are said in different congregations on Sunday. And I think he might be right. You're no longer strangers, Paul writes. You're citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And what does it mean to be a citizen, not an illegal alien? You know, it means you're present rightfully that you can legally be here, that no one can deny you. And it means you have the rights and privileges of a citizen. You can vote, you can participate, you can pay taxes. You know, you do all the things and get all the benefits that come with being a citizen. And most of us have had all of that since the day we were born. We've never known anything different. But in Paul's day, to be a citizen of Rome was a big deal. Not everybody was a citizen. Just because you lived in their empire didn't mean that you had any rights or were a citizen. But Paul says, now we are citizens of God's household. We're welcomed into it, we're adopted into it, we're made official, we're part of it. And no one can take that away or kick us out. And that's great cause for rejoicing. It also means, you know, by the way, that we can't kick anybody else out or deny their right to be there. God does the selecting and the calling and the gathering, not us. So Paul says this household is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. So it's built on the proclamation of God's message. That's the foundation of our faith. The word stands to gather us into God's gracious presence, into God's household. And that word is in turn based, built on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. So in Christ, the whole thing is built and joined and grows into this temple for God, he says. And so our faith is finally built on and based on Jesus Christ and nothing else. And even the Bible that we hold up as the inspired message from God is at best a witness to Jesus Christ. It's not finally the basis of our faith. That may shock some of you, and you might have to go think about that, but we worship Jesus Christ, not the Bible. And Jesus came, you know, preaching peace to all of us, both sides of the aisle, as it were. Peace to the Jews and peace to the Gentiles. He drew them into one people, one covenant with himself. And all of us, have access in one spirit to the Father. We're all part of this household in which the Spirit unites us before God the Father. So Jesus breaks down the walls that separate us and divide us and makes one people out of the two. Now, one way to see that that's helpful, I think, to see how that works out in our lives is to see that everything other than Jesus Christ is provisional. Everything else is less than Jesus. So to put it another way, you might say you were a follower of Jesus first and a whatever second. You know, a Democrat, Republican, this race or that race or whatever you are, that comes second. When you see those things as ultimate, we get nowhere. But if you see them as provisional and less than Jesus, then we can come together and begin to find unity. Because when Jesus comes, Ephesians says, he abolished the law and created in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace. So through the cross... He puts to death the hostility that exists between Jew and Greek 
and makes peace. And he comes to make peace in this world. And being resurrected, he shows the world that he loves everybody and brings peace for everybody. So he doesn't come with judgment and condemnation. He comes with love and peace. And so we're all called to be at peace with Christ and with one another. Now, one thing that's, that's happened in the last few decades is that Christianity in this country has become disestablished. I mean, there was a time when Christian faith was the faith of the USA. And it was assumed that most people that you meet were mainline Protestant Christians. You know, we never had an established church legally, but we kind of had one outside the bounds of the law. And it was assumed that whatever mainline Protestant pastors said was policy. You know, the National Council of Churches mattered, and they published the pastor's sermons in the newspaper, and the Sunday blue laws meant that you couldn't do anything on Sunday. Pretty much all you could do was, you know, read the paper. And some people wouldn't even let you do that. But then, pretty quickly, it all began to change. Will Williman writes somewhere that it changed on a certain day in February of 1963 because that's the day that the Fox Theater in Greenville, South Carolina opened and showed movies on Sunday afternoon, which was a horrible new thing. But it was only in the afternoon that they would do it. But you know, the good old days are over. Now they play soccer games on Sunday morning. And many, many people in the, in the land make no pretense about being Christian. There are even Jews and Muslims in the neighborhood. And no one cares what the local pastor thinks or if he thinks. And so for many people, it seems like, you know, the end is near. But it's not the same end that they're thinking of when they say that. It's the end of established Protestant Christianity. But in that moment, the church is set free. The church is set free from the requirements of that establishment. We are set free from the need to follow cultural dictates, and we're set free to follow Jesus and him alone. So we, we can lament the loss of those good old days, but they weren't really all that good. And on the whole, their passing away is a pretty good thing for us. We're set free to follow Jesus. And that means we're united as one people in Christ with people who are as different from us as Jews were from Greeks. We're united with people from other countries, and even other races. We're all united in Jesus Christ. God is making of us a holy temple in the Lord through the power of the Spirit. So we all come together and we all grow together by and through the Holy Spirit. And we will become a temple, a dwelling place for the very presence of Jesus in this world. That's the goal. That's the future that God is calling us to participate in. And in that temple, we'll join with people of every land and race to welcome the presence of Christ among us. That's the goal of God's work in our world. That's, that's why we're here. Now, I might have told you the story of my friend John before. He was a semi-retired furniture executive I say semi-retired, I think they kind of eased him out and sort of fired him because he made too much money. I'm not really sure how that went, but all of a sudden he no longer had to work much. And he got himself appointed to the board of a local evangelical 
group that worked out of this church. And he said, I disagree with most of what they teach, but they're doing good things in this town and that need to be done. So I'm going to help them. And so for several years, they got a lot of Presbyterian backing and a lot of Presbyterian funding, which helped the town realize that they should be accepted and, and supported. Well, John also got involved with racial stuff, racial issues. And one day he learned that the black people who shopped at a local grocery store had to endure the embarrassment of having their driver's licenses carefully reviewed whenever they wrote a check. And then the store clerks would write black on the face of their check in big letters. So John went over there and bought some stuff, handed the girl a check. She said, thank you, sir, have a nice day. And he just stood there. And he said, don't you want to see my driver's license? Oh, no, sir, I don't need that. Well, aren't you going to write white on the front of my check? At that point, she called a manager because she didn't know what to do. And the manager was told in fairly plain language that this racial profiling needed to stop immediately. And he knew that some people would try to pass bad checks and some of them might be black, some of them would be white, but that was you know, just part of doing business and had nothing to do with their race. But if he didn't stop the profiling, then my friend John would personally assure him, make, make sure that no Presbyterian ever shopped in that store again. And it stopped, which was a pretty good thing, because I don't know where we would have shopped. <laughs> well, it didn't resolve all the problems in that little town, and it didn't change a lot of minds, and most people didn't even know he did that, but it was one small step toward making peace and bringing the races together. And that's how it is when you're following Jesus. You make one small step at a time. You do what you can. God does the rest. God is faithful in his efforts, and so we can be faithful in ours. So, you're citizens of God's household. Don't let anybody try to divide you into groups or tell you different. We belong to Jesus Christ through whom we have access in one spirit to the Father. And thanks be to God. Amen.
And so let us say what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let us come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks and praise for your love for us, for your love which, despite our running away all the time and dividing ourselves into groups and fighting with each other, came to live among us in Jesus Christ and died to conquer death and sin and lives again, resurrected, to be our Lord. And so we give you thanks and we give you praise for what you have wrought in Jesus Christ and for the gift of salvation that you give to us. We give you our praise now and forever. We pray, O oh God, for the people of this world, for the people in the Northwest fighting the fires and the droughts, for the people in Germany whose towns are flooded, for the people of Cuba who can't get food or medicine, for people all over the world who are in need and, and who need you, but who also need us to hear them. They need the church to take their side. And so we pray for them. We pray that you will be with them. Just as we pray that you will be with the sick, those who are ill, those who recuperate those who are getting better, those who will not get better. Be with them and bring them the healing that you see best for them. Comfort those who mourn. Oh God, those whose grief is fresh and those whose grief is old but still powerful, give them comfort. Be with those who are disturbed and confused relieve their anxieties and help them to know that no matter where they go or what they do, you are with them. We pray for those who serve our country as elected leaders or in the military. We pray that you will give them courage and wisdom, give them the strength to do what is right and for those who are overseas, bring them safely home, home to be with those who love them. We pray for your church in whatever form or flavor it, it worships. We pray that you will pour out your spirit upon it and you will be with it and in it and that you will lead your church slowly at times, but lead your church further and further into your truth, into that holy temple where we are built together spiritually as a dwelling place for our Lord God. 
We know that you hear us in Jesus Christ. We make our prayers in his name, and we pray the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. So go in peace, go and know that wherever you go and whatever you do, God is with you in Jesus Christ. And as you go, may all the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit go with you now and forever. Alleluia. Amen. Amen.